Hello and welcome everyone to our 2024 end-to-end -end supply chain outlook webinar. I hope you're staying healthy and being well. My name is Brace Kane and I'm your moderator for today. Before we continue, I want to pause a moment for those that may be having difficulty connecting to the audio feature for today's webinar. If you can hear me, that's great. You have it figured out. Today, our goal is to provide you with an update on how air freight, ocean freight, trade compliance, and global logistics and distribution are impacting the global supply chain, and hopefully to share some insights that will help you be successful. Please be aware, however, that this webinar is for informational purposes only and does not constitute as legal advice. I would also like to remind everyone all the participant lines will be muted throughout the duration of our call today, and this webinar is being recorded. We have planned time at the end of our discussion today for some Q&A, so please make sure to use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of the screen for any questions you may have throughout. And we have a team of experts behind just in case they can answer your questions quickly. And if you have detailed information that you may need, they can help you with that too but we may do some live as according to how much time we have left. If you've attended any of our previous webinars, you know that one of our resonating themes is communications. As a reminder, a copy of this presentation and a link to the recording will be available following the webinar. So you will have access to these URLs. But I wanted to introduce our presenters today we have Alex Fuller, Director of Marketing for International Air Freight, Jeff Von Blatt, Director of Marketing, Global Ocean Product, Kelly Wilton, Compliance Manager, Cross-Border Trade, and Marianne Crawford, IE Section Manager, Global Logistics Distribution. I wanted to take you through our agenda of what we're going to be talking about today. As you can see, the supply chain solutions network is vast, but we're going to be talking about a lot of things here. We're starting with getting to manufacturing, going through air and ocean freight, through our customs, grounds transport, through our warehousing and distribution, and finally, the last mile. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Fuller to talk about our global macroeconomic trends. All right, awesome. Brace, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, yeah, so two slides here. I'm going to just jump in on what uh, recent macroeconomic trends have been. And as we look into 2024, uh, how those might play into air ocean brokerage and, and uh, distribution. So uh, first off, inflation. Uh, very, very good news coming in the last few months. The inflation has gone down quite a bit. So we're about half where we were about a year ago. So you see on the left side of the screen uh, across uh, Europe, U.S., China, APAC, all those numbers coming down. And as we look into 2024, we see them moderating to the you know target levels of two to three percent. So that's that's good news across the board for a lot of policy implications. Um, so excited for that to, to hopefully spur some economic growth in 2024. As we look at hey, what will that bring with GDP over on the right? Uh, this is real global GDP. Uh, we see the first half of the year uh, maybe a little bit lower than we've seen in 2023, so 2.1, uh, 2% annualized growth rate Q1, Q2 next year. But we do anticipate uh, from the sources we received a, a big growth on the back, end, back half of the year, so 2.5, 2.7. So really, you know, we see generally kind of as is a first half and then second half uh, potentially some accelerate, acceleration uh, globally. And we'll dive into what regions might be causing that in just a second. So overall story for this, inflation, you know, everything's tracking the right direction. That's good news. GDP, uh, looking at back half of 2024 to really see kind of ramp up to, you know, that over 2.5% that we'd like to see uh, up into three. Um, with that, we'll go into the next slide where we're going to talk a little bit about region-specific forecasts. Um, so on the left, we got four lines here, real GDP I just talked about. But 
then, you know, with supply chains, there's other factors that might drive things even more. Uh, real exports, that teal line, uh, we saw quite a big drop in exports in 23. We see that recovering quite a bit into 24. Definitely nothing we saw during COVID, but back up in that 3% range. So that's, that's good news for exporters out there and also has a lot of implications for rates and, and capacity, those kind of things. Uh, industrial production, a, uh, we saw it low in 23. We see a mild return in 2024, uh, but it just kind of sneaking a, a peak on the right. The U.S. Uh, forecast a lower industrial production in 24. So uh, anyone related to you know the industrial side of the house uh, with different industries, that's potentially a struggle continuing into the 2024. Uh, and then finally, retail sales. Um, that has been up a decent amount in 23. We see that increasing just a little bit. So anyone in the uh, consumer-facing side probably continuing to see the same type of trends you'll see in the next few months carry on to 2024. Again, still nothing like we've seen uh, during the last two, three years, but, but heading in the right direction. Uh, over on the right, as we look across different regions, uh, the big story you know, across the board is we see positive growth uh, in almost all factors except for that industrial production in the U.S., uh, but, you know, exports, uh, GDP, all looking to in the positive way. Uh, APAC and China really driving it with, you know, over 4% in all three of those factors. So, um, you know, it's definitely not the 8 9% we've seen, you know, historically pre-COVID with, with substantial growth. It's definitely not the 10 20% we've seen in the last few years with COVID. But moving in 2024, we, we return to more of a normal state. Um, and then again, back to the, the quarter three, quarter four GDP, that's where we might see, uh, or at least now where we're anticipating some additional growth in the next year. So um, I'll, I'll keep going in just a minute to talk about air freight specifically. Um, but if there are any questions about um, macro trends, feel free to throw them in the Q&A. Um, and we have some experts that can try to jump on those. So Brace, let's jump into my favorite product, just because that's what I eat and breathe all day long, air freight. Um, and I want to talk about, you know, uh, a few different factors that are going to impact air freight for 2024. And, and I think where this is important is as you out there with your company sitting down to plan budgets, you know, where are air freight rates going? Um, you know, what can we expect for demand and capacity, which ultimately drives those rates? So, I don't have any crystal ball, and uh, you can't hold me to any of these predictions, but I'll at least give you my thoughts and what I'm thinking. Um, I'm glad we had that disclaimer at the front, so don't, don't hold me to this, but I'll give you my best, my best crystal ball uh, guess of what's going to happen in 24, uh, 2024. So on the left, this is your classic uh, supply and demand uh, graph, if you remember Econ 101. So that yellow line is capacity, so how many planes and how much space uh, is out there. And then the blue line is demand. So this is this is what's driving rates globally. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone has PTSD from the whiplash they got for rates in 21, 22. For this year, we've seen a lot of capacity come on board, so a lot more planes in the air uh, as as passenger travel travel comes back, as freighters come back, and then demand has really increased. So there was a lot of shipping activity 21, 22. Inventory is filled up, and so the need for air freight in 2023 was a lot lower. So that's why you've seen the result of rates just plummeting in 2023. And if you look over on the right side, uh, you know, it rates year over year are down 40% in June, 38% in July. So huge, huge decline because you have tons of open space and planes and less people wanting air freight. Uh, that story is switching in 2024, or at least that's, you know, that's what we're, we're predicting or forecasting. Um, so as the economy potentially starts to heat up, but more importantly, as inventories that were built up in the beginning of this year kind of get depleted, suddenly there's a need to bring in more product faster, um, so throwing it on planes instead of boats um, or ships. So what we see is global demand going up 4.7% next year and capacity maybe down a little bit, essentially flat. Uh, and so overall, as, as I look to budget for the next year, I'd say, hey, you know, rates potentially, you know, I see them flatter first half of the year. And again, 
back half of the year 2024, that's where I see rates potentially going up quite a bit. Um, for those of you that remember, you know, a lot of times there's peak fees and surcharges or, or huge increases in rates during the Q4 time. I think that might be a strong possibility. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the general story as we, as we look into this. Um, one more slide, I guess the key takeaways I'd say for air freight out there, um, you know, air cargo demand is returning. And so unless there's a ton more flights coming on board, which we don't anticipate, I think overall you're going to see rates come up, especially Asia to North America. Um, I think there's a lot of new e-commerce uh, business coming online as well as high tech rebounding. So, I, you know, rates are already elevated right now. Um, I think they might go down maybe a little bit Q1 as, as the peak season kind of cools down, but then going on into uh, the rest of 2024, I, you know, I see them potentially taking off. So you really want to think, you know, step back and say, hey, rather than riding the spot market, do we potentially want to lock in some, uh, some pricing? Uh, you know, that, that's kind of the, the main story there. Obviously, there's things to look at. The inventory to sales ratio, if that continues to go down, that's a big leading indicator that rates will continue to go up. And then just overall, um, oil prices, fuel prices have a big effect as well. So far, we haven't, you know, we, we've seen some stabilization in fuel rates and even decline in jet fuel in the last few weeks. But uh, global conflicts and those kind of things can have a big uh, spike there. So overall takeaway from air freight is, we, we see rates going up uh, next year. And with that, I will pass it off to Jeff to talk about Ocean. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks for letting me have a few minutes, folks, to talk about my favorite product, uh, Ocean Freight. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, very similar view than what you saw a second ago from my colleague, Alex. Uh, demand looks about the same. It was It's improved a little bit. We put a Q2 number in here on the left-hand side, as well as the most recent Q3 numbers. So demand has improved or is expected to improve a little bit. But um, as all of you know, uh, as well as I do for Ocean, it's all about capacity, right? So capacity, the numbers on here have improved slightly from Q2 to Q3, but still remain high. Uh, and that's the big, uh, the big uh, challenge here right now. It, it puts pressure on rates. Um, and I can tell you this from a, from personal experience, my high school age children are probably tired at this point of talking about supply and demand in ocean when they bring up economics classes. So we'll uh, we'll save that for a breakout session with them later. Um, but the 23 looks a, a little bit like, or the end of 23 looks a little bit like what Alex was talking about. Um, but we have downward pressure on rates due to the capacity issues. So we'll just get into more detail on that on the next slide. So the three most important things to consider about ocean, capacity, capacity, and capacity, right? Or in this case, capacity, capacity, and green fleet. So a few things about new build capacity injection. There was about 1.5 million T's that came into the market or will come into the market in 23. That is, according to Drury, expected to double next year to 3 million plus and go onward from there. So again, we think back to the last slide, how is... Demand going to keep up with that? Well, um, it probably will not. Um, and we'll talk a little bit that, about that here on this slide. So it puts pressure on rates to, to drop rates. We've seen over the last few months, GRIs followed by GRD. So the market is still trying to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. Um, and that's going to continue into 24, most likely, um, which will lead to most likely increased carrier, uh, excuse me, carrier capacity management, um, as well as potentially more focus on the green fleet transition. So some things on carrier capacity management, we all know what blank sailings are. We expect those to continue. The expectation is that those are going to increase in 24. Um, scrapping has not, scrapping of vessels has not kept on pace with what was promised or expected. We expect that to pick up pace in 24. Um, but lastly, I think we expect other things to pick up pace as well, which is um, slow steaming, or I would call slower steaming um, into 24, more scrapping. Um, I do want to spend just a second and talk about delaying new build delivery. So that's one thing that could potentially slow this, 
but we do not expect that to happen slash we call it unlikely because of the last major bullet on this slide, which is the green fleet transition. So there's been some, some new goals and plans that have come out of the later, latest meetings about getting to 50%. I think the number is, uh, let me look at my notes here real quick, net zero level by around 2050. So there's more focus on conversion over to green fleet. Um, the good news Bad news is, I guess, is the vessels, about 3.5% of the vessels that are active today are green fleet or alternate fuel. Um, the order book is about 97%. So we expect that to change pretty quickly here over the next couple of years. However, that doesn't come at a cost. I mean, that does come at a cost. There are some concerns about the availability of, of all the different fuels, whether it's um, methanol or or biodiesel, et cetera. So the, most of our uh, carriers are trying to diversify their order books to make sure they don't have all their eggs in one basket. So a lot going on here in Ocean um, as we finish 23 going into 24, a lot of pressure on the rates to drop down. Also, a lot of expectations that the carriers are gonna do what they can to stabilize the rates, um, which may cause some service issues in the industry. So. Um, I'll come to it later in this presentation, but we do need to keep an eye on service because obviously slow steaming and, and blank sailings will impact service. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about how to sort of guard against that later on in the presentation. So that's it on the ocean side. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly for an update on trade compliance. All right. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate that. And good afternoon, all. So hey, I'm going to be switching directions or switching gears a little bit because trade compliance doesn't really, you know, play into the whole capacity versus um, demand versus rates discussion. Uh, trade compliance is just that trade compliance. So my focus is going to be more on some of the regulatory changes to be expecting and ones that we, we have experienced up till now. So let's go ahead and jump into my first slide here. I wanted to start off with um, some enhancements to ACE that occurred this year. Uh, primarily from the perspective that these are likely some of the last enhancements that we should expect. So ACE is, you know, that's the automated commercial environment, and that's the customs operating system, right? All import data from importers, carriers, brokers, you know, it all flows through ACE. And customs and the various other partner government agencies, they receive that data to enable them to process and release shipments. But, you know, funding for further development in ACE is gone. And there is there's only money added to the customs budget every year to just maintain the system. Um, no new enhancements until guess what? ACE 2.0 gets developed. So customs is working on funding right now for ACE 2.0. They're trying to outline a framework and they're planning on development to maybe get started in 2025. Um, so we're all looking forward to ACE 2.0 and all that it's going to offer. But in the meantime, we are very, very thankful that the FDA port code change and the ID release functionality was released this year. So that addressed two very big challenges that entry filers have been facing for years. Um, perhaps you know, quite transparent to importers, but quite a, a major coup for, um, for brokers and even for carriers. So, um, so good news there. And you know, there I have to I have to talk about China and forced labor, right? So there were several developments. Uh, regarding forced labor on goods being imported from China that throughout 2023. There was an entity list, which is, well, it's a, it's a list of entities um, that are known to have um, ties to forced labor. And it was updated several times in 2023. And it shows that Customs is really diligently using it as a tool to help them target suspect shipments. And as well, Customs has released a report of industries that are most prone to forced labor and that they're using that to better narrow down their targeting efforts. You know, and finally, it did become a requirement in 2023 to include in the entry data, the postal code of all the Chinese exporters that were involved. And if that postal code represents any location in the Xinjiang province, a warning message was received um, by the entry filer that it just it warns that customs may detain the shipment and encouraging us to work with the importers to make sure they proactively investigate their supply chain and, and be prepared if they need to support or substantiate that forced labor wasn't used. 
So, you know, all these features really demonstrate that Customs continues to develop their tools to improve their targeting. Um, and they're trying to really stop the import of goods made with forced labor. And they, they made some good progress throughout 2023. And that carries us on to my next slide, which talks about what we're expecting in 2024. And guess what? The UF LPA is right at the top of my list. So I'll just carry on that same topic. Um, you know, preventing import of goods made with forced labor, that's not going to go away. The whole prevention effort is not going to go away. In fact, it's going to intensify. Customs does continue to develop new tools that will aid in their enforcement. And they're going to continue to rely on importers um, to help with that effort, you know, to know their supply chains. And not just tier one and two suppliers, but to really go all the way back to the raw goods that make the components, that make the imported product. So really understanding top to bottom supply chain. And recently, Customs has even mentioned they don't want you to focus just on the people who make the goods, but maybe even the people who are brought in to clean the facility, the banks and financial institutes that, um, that are used by the manufacturers, you know, all the other parties that might be peripheral to the actual manufacturing process. Um, and so the importers are expected to really work closely with their suppliers. Um, it's, it's really because bottom line is the entities who are happy to use forced labor in any capacity, or even those that will turn a blind eye to the use of forced labor in, you know, with partners that they outsource certain functions to, you know, that not only poses a human rights concern, which I think we're all aware of and support, but also it gives them an unfair pricing and competition advantage. So forced labor, you know, we really should expect forced labor enforcement to be on everyone's radar into 2024 and beyond. Now let's talk a little bit about the PGAs, right? So we are expecting some changes in partner government agency reporting in 2024. We are expecting CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, to mandate certain reporting requirements in 2024. They're currently conducting a pilot program, which is expected to last about six months, and those findings will help to shape the final rule. So again, sometime in 2024, we're expecting to see some results of that pilot. Um, also, the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, they've got the Lacey Act, and the aim of the Lacey Act is to prevent illegal harvesting of plant products. And so they are adding new products that are going to require knowledge by the importer of record of the country of harvest of those plant products and make declarations that it was harvested lawfully. So again, if you're importing a finished product made of wood, you as the importer are expected to know not only where was that, you know, that wood shaped into the finished good, but where was the wood actually harvested? And, and was it harvested within legal um, parameters? And so it's going to expect you to be able to go back several tiers in your supply chain. Um, so they're adding many more products to the, the list of those that require reporting. Um, another thing the USDA is working on, we're expecting to move to mandatory ACE reporting um, of organics products in early 2024. I think we're talking on March of 2024. So if you sell, you know, import, sell, or market your goods as organics, there will be some reporting requirements due at time of entry. So we're all prepared for that. Um, and finally, I want to talk in this section about bulk bra. That's the modernization of cosmetics regulations. That's going to go into effect in July of 2024. And this is a new legislation, and it requires that uh, facilities that produce or distribute cosmetics be registered with the FDA, and that all the cosmetic products they produce or distribute get assigned a product listing number by FDA. Um, and also right along with that, some new labeling requirements, all that's tied to the regulation. So the, the regulation itself goes into effect this year, December of 2023. But uh, enforcement was delayed until July of 2024. Don't think we're quite ready to, to enforce that yet. It just happened so quickly, all a whirlwind of activity. Um, so, okay, quickly, let's jump into my last topic here, trade programs. Um, so we're hearing rumors that the USTR, the United States Trade Representative, may eliminate, yes, you heard that right, may eliminate some of the 301 tariffs which if, if you're not familiar with 301, it's those are the China tariffs that you may be, hear them referred to. 
Um, the USTR may also reopen the exclusion process. Um, you know, right now there are certain exclusions, you know, certain products that are not required or not um, paying the 301 duties, um, but they may re, all those um, exclusions expire at the end of this year, but they may reopen the process to get new exclusions granted. And so if an importer can demonstrate that certain goods can only be sourced in China and that importation of them will boost the U.S. economy, um, maybe those 301 tariffs wouldn't apply. So we're looking forward to hopefully having this new process. Um, all of that will certainly compl complicate the entry process, but it really does stand to greatly benefit importers that are successful in getting those exclusions. Um, keeping in mind, all of these are just rumors, right? I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have any inside track. Um, my crystal ball may be cloudy, and so this may never come to pass, especially as we're approaching uh, an election year. There could be all sorts of political reasons for it not to happen and also all sorts of political reasons for it to happen. So we'll just have to wait and see how that one plays out. But let's chat a little bit about GSP as well, the generalized system of preferences. So um, that expired back in December of 2020 and has yet to be renewed by Congress. You know, there's been a lot of discussion in Congress, um, especially about how reinstating GSP will help to negate our reliance on imported from China, right? Everyone right now is against China. And so if we can get GSP back on track and allow duty-free import from other countries, it may shift some supply chains and sourcing away from China. So that's been the call to action in Congress recently is let's, let's do this. Let's do GSP to, to drive us more away from China. But there've also been calls to reform GSP, you know, want to strengthen or add greater um, controls over labor, human rights, environmental protections. You know, so right now there's very basic um, criteria to participate in GSP in those areas, but a lot of calls to really strengthen that quite a bit. Um, so bottom line is it sounds like there is some interest in Congress to move forward in 2024, but this as well is still too early to, to predict. It's too difficult to decide at this point in time if any movement's going to happen. And that's the same story for AGOA, the African Growth Opportunity Act. Um, it hasn't expired yet. In fact, it's still good until I believe 2025. But that um, expiration is going to come up faster than, than we can even see fit. Recently, there have been several countries removed from the program because they no longer qualify or because they have very egregious human rights violations. Um, but there are many calls in Congress right now to extend it before it expires, but also, again, a lot of calls to reform it. Um, same as with the GSP, trying to really strengthen some of these other social um, obligations and requirements for the, the country to, to um, meet in order to take the benefit of those uh, free trade and, and no tariffs. So for all of this, we're going to keep our eyes on both of those programs. Uh, we do believe that, um, I'm a firm believer, that duty-free treatment of goods from these poorer countries you know, it's, it's, it's a good investment opportunity for importers. So I want to make sure that you know, as we learn more about it, as we learn that it progresses, I want to make sure our, our importing customers are fully aware of everything that's happening and can take advantage of it. So enough of our trade. I think I'm going to turn the mic over now to Marianne. So take it away, Marianne. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming and, and joining today. And then we all appreciate you all taking time out of your day for this. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the global logistics and distribution sector today, um, similar to everyone else. Going to talk a little bit about the 2023 recap outlook, and then more so focus on our upcoming peak season, which is very very soon, and uh, look into 2024. You want to go to the next slide? So, looking at 2023, our key focus has been on the strategic modernization of our fulfillment centers. So, the e-commerce and the retail industry we have undergone a significant transformation with consumers expecting greater predictability, convenience, and visibility for their deliveries. In response to this market demand, our commitment to deploying the latest technologies within our fulfillment centers has become essential to achieving the experience for our, our customers and their consumers. These strategic deployments have provided us with the flexibility to scale our operations with market dynamics and seasonal fluctuations. In turn, this increases predictability and tailors the consumer experience to our customers' unique brand strategies. This, this ability is crucial in the market where demand and expectations are ever changing. 
ensuring that we can meet customer needs and control expenses efficiently. Here at UPS, we have really focused on both the physical and digital advancements within our modernization tool belt. Over on the left, you'll see some of those physical advancements that I'm referring to. So some of those include optimized inbound and inventory processing by piloting automated unloaders and cycle counting drones. We've also focused on productivity improvements and expanded our processing capacity by using bot integrated picking technologies such as Locus Robotics, E Plus, and AutoStore. We are we've also improved the packaging experience at each step of the process by installing and print apply machinery, automated packaging for both cartons and polybag shipments, and tips orders for that final mile delivery efficiency. Though all of the physical automation is shiny and exciting, um, really the digital optimization that we've made is, is the backbone of our modernization strategy. So we provide end-to-end -end visibility and analytics to our customers through the UPS Supply Chain Symphony portal. We also partner with Sofion for an integrated fulfillment application suite, which covers the order management, warehouse management, and execution system. We also provide real-time productivity information to our operations team through easy metrics for efficiency each and every day. All in all, our investment in modernization is not just a it's about future-proofing our business. As customer demands continue to evolve, we are prepared to meet challenges and opportunities that lie ahead, ensuring our customers receive the best possible service. Okay, so as we get into peak season and beyond on the next slide, there are a couple areas where retailers really shift their focus. Since it's very up and coming, I'll focus first on peak season. So really in this upcoming peak season, um, consumers anticipate that 2023 holiday shopping will resemble 2022. While many want to start their shopping early and avoid the last minute stress to take advantage of those early decisions. Um, according to the recent CNBC study, approximately two thirds of those surveyed anticipate that consumers will actively search for this kind of product. As a result, online shopping is expected to remain the top to seventy percent of holiday consumers. In response to this consumer behavior, retailers must strategically plan holiday promotions and e-commerce fulfillment, plus the delivery supply chains, to effectively offer those whose business most likely to come to the some of those include starting discounts and sales sooner, um, offering free shipping with their shipments, or offering free returns to the companies. As we look at 2024 and beyond, there are really two areas retailers should pay close attention to. The first of those being returns. As e-commerce continues, continues to surge, so do online returns. The impact of returns has emerged as a prominent challenge for many brands with over 90% of retailers reporting that returns are growing faster than sales. The challenge of returns is becoming increasingly complex. On one hand, offering a convenient and hassle-free return experience is critical to building brand loyalty, and four out of five consumers express their willing, unwillingness to purchase from a brand if they have a negative prior returns experience. On the flip side, the cost of managing the flow of returns is mounting and pressuring the bottom line. While 80% of retailers express a desire to manage the complexity and cost associated with returns, less than a third reported a formal program that is making progress towards that objective. This challenge does not become easier in the future. The U.S. e-commerce sector is poised for continued expansion, with anticipated annual growth rate of nearly 12%. With continued growth in online purchasing, addressing the reverse logistics supply chain will now pay increased dividends moving forward. The second area of focus is going to be the omni-channels area. So e-commerce will drive retail sales once again. The crazy highs and lows of the past few years are gone, and retail sales will normalize to pre-pandemic trends. Omni-channel retail requirements have accelerated dramatically, driven by consumers who now anticipate a smooth and unified shopping experience across physical stores. Online platforms, social media, ads, and marketplaces. Retailers must prioritize every commerce channel, crafting a unified omni-channel experience that ensures fluid and seamless interactions throughout the entirety of a customer shopping journey. 
In order to answer these evolving consumer expectations, retailers must integrate their systems, track inventory in real time, and meet customer demand on any panel at any time. Ensuring a seamless experience across all channels would be complex and possible. So as we navigate the challenges and opportunities ahead, it's clear that the success will hinge on retailers' ability to be agile, customer-focused, and technology-driven. Thank you all for your attention today, and we look forward to a year of innovation and adaptation in the retail industry. I'll hand it back over to Brian. But thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists for taking the time to share your valuable insights with us today. And I appreciate your expertise. But with our key takeaways, I think I wanna go back through all the panelists and to give me one thing to take away from what you talked about so that our guest will say, hey, now I know what you were talking about. I love it, that's what I'm gonna take away. So I'm going to start with Alex. All right, uh, pretty clear message, prepare for rate takeoff. Uh, consider locking in longer term rates. If you've been riding the spot market for the last few years, uh, just be prepared if things go up. And for Ocean, we talked about capacity. So I think the message here is to be flexible and really more importantly, to partner with partners that are flexible. When you think about blank sailings and slow steaming, um, we would want to make sure we have a partner that has access to more than one carrier's worth of sailing so that we can uh, balance our networks out. And my key takeaway is expect changes. By that, I mean the bad guys keep getting smarter, right? So customs needs to keep getting smarter. So, so you'll have to keep trying to ensure that you provide the necessary information and do your necessary research so that you can comply with all these great changes to expect out of customs and the partner government agencies. Mine would be to stay agile. Um, a retailer's success is going to hinge on their ability to be agile and flexible. Um, they're gonna need to stay customer focused and a critical item will be using technology to drive those changes. Well, thank you all again. That's great information. And I also want to encourage everyone, if you would like to keep up with everything that's going on with all these different products that we talked about, please subscribe to the email updates. And Anna will be leaving the link in the chat so that you can sign up for all the email updates from our panelists and from our subject matter experts. There it is right there. So please grab a hold of that. And now I believe we're going to head over to our Q&A for anyone. And don't forget that little box down at the bottom, go ahead and use it because we have a few that are there. But we also have some that came in when you received your invite to participate with this webinar. So we did receive a couple in there. So I'm going to throw these out and I believe we have our experts behind the scenes as well. The first one, is how has the integration of digital technologies into your fulfillment centers improved the efficiency and accuracy of order fulfillment and what specific benefits have customers experienced as a result? Hi, Grace. Um, I, I'll take for Grace. Thank you. I'll take that one. So hi, everybody. This is Scott Erdl, uh, Director of Product Strategy for Global Logistics and Distribution. So as, as Marianne talked about, and, and you know, understand there were some uh, audio quality issues there, but uh, hope, hopefully you were able to see you know, many of the exciting investments and, and innovations we made within within our fulfillment offering. Um, but you know, in terms of customer impact, you know, both the the digital investment around you know managing volume, managing order priority and being able to sequence that and dispatch that in, in an efficient, effective way. Well, sounds like I have rough audio as well. Apologies. Um, you know, combined with, you know, the the automation with, you know, within the process is about, you know, improving order quality. So, you know, getting the right product to the right time or right product to the right person on time. Um, reducing delivery lead time, so improving predictability and, and improving that consumer experience. And then 
Um, you know, obviously lower cost associated with the efficiency. But you know, as as we work with our customers, a lot of the impact is about scalability and flexibility, being able to manage the various peak seasons uh, between national retail and wholesale versus e-commerce. Those processes are very different. Having a fulfillment process that is agile to be able to flex to changes in demand is, is critical to, to that outcome. Um, and also just seasonal volume um, fluctuations in volume having the infrastructure and having the process to to manage you know the the onslaught of volume that that is you know right on our doorstep here with with peak season approaching us um in an efficient way and you know delivering on time and providing that positive uh, experience for the consumer awesome thank you very much and i have one more and hopefully i can i can still get you in there scott Given the growing significance of returns in the retail landscape, could you share some best practices or strategies that we've adopted to ensure seamless and positive return experiences for customers? And how have these efforts impacted customer loyalty? Sure, I'm happy to take that one. So you know, from a returns perspective, you know, I, I view the returns process really in, in through two different lenses. First is the the consumer returns experience, which is which has really been a priority for the last three to four years with the growth of e-commerce, making the returns experience a seamless, kind of hassle-free and, and easy process for the consumer, which is which is critical for them to you know, from a you know lifetime value brand or repurchase rate, um, you know, with with each individual brand. Um, you know, from, from a UPS perspective, our, our recent uh, announced acquisition of, of Happy Returns and the, you know, hassle-free, no box, no label solution that they bring to the market is, is hands down a preferred option from a consumer experience perspective, where, you know, it provides them, you know, not only flexibility, but, but also convenience in terms of you know, returning their product, you know, taking it to a store with a QR code. And, and makes that a, a frictionless process for them, uh, which drives a positive experience and a fast refund uh, back to them. But then secondarily, as that product moves through the supply chain, really having integration from you know, the, the returns management system for efficiency, for you know, agile disposition of material based on condition and strategy at a SKU level, you know, really trying to optimize the, the value that our customers can, can reap regain and retain from that returned inventory and having an efficient process to restock that material for, for quick resale in season while the product is still at its highest value uh, to, to reduce discounts and, and markdowns in, um, you know, in after season. Thank you very much, Scott. And I believe we did have some questions come in from our Q&A, so don't forget, it's down at the bottom. So I think we have over 200 people that are still here. The first question, I believe, is going to Mr. Fuller. And the question is, why have CN to U.S. rates shot up in the last two weeks for air freight? Okay, that, that's a question I was mind. Why have China to U.S. air freight rates uh, exploded? Um, and it, I, I'm not going to use an econ 101 analogy, but there is a there's just a lot of demand that uh, surprised the market. So especially on the e-commerce side, there's lots of uh, new e-commerce companies that we didn't have shipping before. Um, so like Timu, Sheen, those types of uh, companies new to the market, taking up a lot of capacity. Um, and so as as e-commerce takes planes away, suddenly the remaining space becomes more valuable. So that's that's the main reason um, rates in some, you know, from some places to China to some places in the U.S. have gone up three, four dollars per kilo in the last couple months. Um, so, uh, you know, that that's kind of, uh, you know, this is peak season, so it's not a super surprise. We, we thought it would be a lot moderated, but with all that e-commerce, it has pushed us up to a peak season. Um, if those e-commerce players continue into next year, that's going to potentially drive the rates and even, you know, next 
next peak, so 2024 Q4, that's where we could see even more, uh, even, you know, a lot bigger peak season. So good question, Jason. Thank you. I have another one that did come in here, and I think this one's an Alex and a Jeff. And the question is, with, with the move of more manufacturing out of Malaysia and Vietnam, is UPS SCS increasing air freight and ocean flights and sailings? And for ocean, are there any fast boat equivalents to Matson CLX out of Malaysia? Normal 46 to 56 days is long, although better than the 104 days it was taken in September 2021. Awesome. I'll, I'll start with this. Yeah, we'll bring in Jeff to, to speak to Ocean. So in general, we are seeing a lot of freight lane shifts. There's a lot of companies uh, realigning their supply chains. So there's, you know, China plus one moving to other Asian countries. We also see a lot of trade lane shifts to near shore in Mexico. Um, so in general, I mean, UPS is absolutely uh, realigning flights or working with different carriers uh, on both the air and ocean side to know, fit those trade lane shifts. Um, I'd say in general, just as kind of a rule of thumb, more information you can bring to your UPS account uh, manager and say, hey, we're, we're moving to Malaysia, we're moving to Vietnam, you know, here, here's what's going on. Uh, you know, they can, want, the more information they have, the more options they can bring to you and say, you know, hey, you know, we, we work with our operations. If you let us know, hey, I really need, you know, these fast transit times or whatever, there's lots of options that we can we can dive into. So, Jeff, maybe you can give a quick preview on some of those. I was just going to say that you spoke very well about the ocean side of that as well, and not just the IAF side. Um, we do recognize the shift, um, China plus one, et cetera. We are working with our carriers to make sure we've got good service out of all the origins uh, that the, the manufacturing is moving into. Uh, we are talking to carriers about availability, uh, of fast boats and we do offer services like preferred LCL that are quicker than FCL. If your shipments are on the smaller side, obviously you always have an up, uh, ability to upgrade the air freight to get the goods to the US or wherever their destination is quick, more quickly. But just like Alex said, I would say, let's, uh, let's talk to our account reps or shoot me an email and we can figure out how to put a solution together. Excellent. I had a couple more come in, and I believe this is, it might be for you, Jeff. How do you anticipate the Panama Canal drought will impact ocean freight shipments into 2024? Actually, Bryce, I'm sorry. We were going to answer that in the chat um, and okay. put, some good, put some good information in there for everybody to see. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We will do that. And then I have one more that came in. It's from demand supply chain planning. What should UPS expect in peak season 2023? I'll, I'll take a shot at this, Brace. So uh, what's peak 2023 going to look like? Uh, there's lots of perspectives you could, you could take with this. Um, some I can speak to, some I'll just allude to. So for, you know, ocean, the ocean freight side, peak has probably already happened. Um, I think a lot of the... Uh, Stuff is either on the water or being delivered. So I, I doubt that's what the question is. Air freight side, we're in the middle of peak. Um, we're middle of November through December. This is the, the hot time right now where everyone's trying to get stuff uh, off, the, off their factory floor and onto the plane and into warehouses, into consumers' hands. So we're right in the middle. And you know, kind of what we spoke to earlier, you know, rates are up. They're probably going to stay elevated uh, through the second or third week of December. Uh, and then if you, uh, if this is a you know, UPS overall question of, you know, for small package delivery, how's peak 2023 going to go? I'd say lots of plans in place to have it a successful, uh, uh, successful peak for 2023. So, um, you know, I, I think overall uh, biggest movers on the air freight side where we have seen dramatic changes in rates. Um, and again, it's kind of a surprise of how much demand there is. Excellent. And I do not have any more questions. That may be wrapping up our webinar today. And as we conclude today's webinar, I'd like to encourage you to take a moment to complete the survey 
that will be offered to you when you close out of Zoom today. We appreciate your feedback and questions, and thank you again for joining us. Have a safe and enjoyable day and weekend.